So on behalf of Monumental uh, and the School Cities and the Infrastructure Institute, I'd like to welcome you to Future Builds, Excellence in Real Estate Development. My name is Karen Chappell. I'm director of the School of Cities at the University of Toronto. Um, and before I introduce Maddie, Zara, and Kofi, I'd like to start uh, by honoring the land that we're on, which has been the site of human activity since time immemorial. It's the traditional territories of the Huron Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently the Missagas of the First Credit uh, of the Credit River First Nations. Ontario is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements and is home to many indigenous nations from across Turtle Island, including the Inuit and the Metis. These treaties and other agreements, including the One Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, are agreements to peaceably share and care for the land and its resources. Other indigenous nations, Europeans and newcomers were invited into this covenant in the spirit of respect, peace, and friendship. We are mindful of broken covenants and we strive to make this right with the land and with each other. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, newcomers in this generation or generations past. I'd also like to acknowledge those of us who came here forcibly, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. Therefore, I honor and pay tribute to the ancestors of African origin and descent. We're excited to welcome you all to this fireside chat with trailblazers in the real estate development sector in Toronto. And this is the launch event for Future Builds, a brand new BIPOC real estate development incubator. Future Builds is led by the school city's own urbanists in residence, Zara Ibrahim and Kofi Hope, co-founders of Monumental, and it's implemented in partnership with the Infrastructure Institute at U of T School of Cities, which is directed by my colleague, Maddie Simiotiki. So now I'll hand the podium over to Maddie to speak to this amazing incubator um, and to launch our panel this evening. Thank you. Good evening. It's so nice to see all of you tonight. Uh, in fact, the, your presence and this turnout and this audience is a reflection of why we need this program. It highlights the need to make the infrastructure and real estate sector in particular more diverse and more inclusive. We have a sector that has created fabulous wealth when it comes to real estate, but it has been also exclusionary and in many cases systemically racist. And we need to change that. And this program that we are launching tonight, the Future Builds Incubator, uh, with my colleagues Kofi Hope and Zara Ibrahim, is a small sliver of what we can do when we collaborate, when universities work with the community, and when we see uh, programs that intentionally works to bring a greater pool of people into the sphere of real estate and development. So it is my great uh, pleasure to be here, to be launching this program uh, together. We at the Infrastructure Institute have been working in this space uh, for some time. We launched something called the Social Purpose Real Estate Accelerator Program, which is focused on uh, helping nonprofit groups to launch their own social purpose real estate projects, particularly focused on uh, affordable housing and community spaces. And many of the leaders of those groups are themselves uh, from the BIPOC uh, communities who had been struggling to get their own projects built. In this program, we push even further to work with individuals as part of their broader communities who have a dream and an aspiration and a goal and a plan to deliver real estate projects that will benefit them and benefit their communities. And it's really the innovation that comes from people working with their own communities, with their own creativity and their own ideas that will really help our city achieve uh, what it could be and what it can be when everyone feels like it has a place, everyone can prosper from uh, the benefits of what we are doing here together. So it's really my pleasure to be launching this program tonight uh, with the discussion that we're going to be having about how we make the real estate sector 
uh, more diverse and more inclusive so that more people can prosper. So with that, I am so pleased to be uh, to call up Kofi and Zara uh, to take it away and get the evening uh, going. Thank you, everyone, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. All right. Good evening, everyone. Oh, no, I got to try uh, yeah, one more we time. Gotta, we gotta, Good evening, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we are so excited to have you here with us this evening. Thank you, Maddie, for that introduction. And we're also, you know, very proud partners, not just with Future Builds, but with the Spree program. And I'd really encourage anyone here who's connected to a nonprofit organization or a charity that has land or is looking to develop it to look up that program because it really is kind of rocket fuel to help nonprofits and charities develop housing in our city. Um, we have an incredible panel together for you tonight, mm -hmm. folks who are going to get very honest and frank about their journeys to success in real estate development, talking about the challenges they faced, some of the insights that were there, and how they overcame some of the barriers that come up along the way. And we know, friends, there are barriers in this sector. Before we launched the program, we spent about a year doing research into the experiences of racialized professionals in this industry, and we heard a lot about folks who had great ideas, who had dynamism, who had innovative approaches, who felt it was an industry where there was, you know, like not even a glass, a concrete ceiling that came on yeah. how far you could go. They spoke about development process as being almost like this code that, you know, people who had the kind of code book were not willing to share, wouldn't let you in the room when those things were being discussed, and people tried to figure it out, and so many we met were burnt out, didn't see a career for themselves there, or looking at entrepreneurship. So we realized the need for a program like this was key. And just a couple stats. We found from the research, and this is the very little bit of race-based data we know in Canada, that only 14% of folks at the C-suite level in our country in real estate development are people of color. And I don't know if people are New York Times readers. There was an article that came out this weekend, and it was looking, I see nodding heads. It said in the United States, there's 112,000 real estate development companies, and 111,000 of them are majority white owned. So the space in North America for our communities in this industry traditionally has been quite limited. And that's why we're looking to create this program and do events like this to bring together our communities so that we can really bust open some of those doors and help each other climb over those barriers so we can really build shared prosperity for our communities and do something about this crushing housing crisis that we're facing today. And so despite the barriers, we are hopeful because there are pathways. So through our research, we learned that entrepreneurs who want to get into the space need three things. They need access to the knowledge. Like Kofi said, real estate development is opaque, and it seems intentionally so. And so people need access to how does this process, process work? Where does it start? Where does it end? People need networks of mentors. They need networks of social capital, people who can, they can swap tips with to say, how did you get this done? Who did you do it with? Tradespeople that they can sort of work with through a network of trusted professionals. And then the third that will be completely unsurprising is people said they needed access to capital. How do I walk into a bank and not have folks laugh me right out when I say this is my first project? And so we're hopeful, and tonight's panel is an example of that, but even just with the energy, like all of you here just being here interested in this program, interested in this topic, we're really hopeful that we can start to build the capacity in our communities so we start to see those stats change. So, you know, the thing that we really want for this program that will start tonight with the conversations with all of you, and yes, we're talking to our amazing speakers tonight, but we've already had some conversations with folks that there's a gentleman here in the front row who's been doing this work in Hamilton for 30 years. Our communities have been working, and someone said to me earlier, I think it was, it was Michelle right here who said, they've been working in the workarounds. So I think it's time to sort of stop working in the workarounds and actually start you know, being able to work together and develop a new version of this system. So new thinking, agility, new ideas. Um, if we can bring that to bear, I think we can see our cities thrive. So with that, we want to introduce our amazing panel. 
And we'll just say that after the panel, we'll have a chance to have a conversation. We realized actually when we were setting up that we should have actually just had a conversation before because all of you were already chatting and telling us your stories. And so we really hope that you stick around after this amazing conversation. But for now, we're going to welcome our amazing panelists up. So we'll just take a moment to embarrass them and read their bios because they're super, super cool. Uh, so we're starting with Sherry Larjani, who's the president of Spotlight Development, Inc. and the founder of Ar the ARIA Foundation. Sherry Larjani is an experienced real estate developer and entrepreneur with a focus on creating beautifully defined spaces that bring her visions to life. Sherry began her career working as a designer at a luxury architecture firm in Toronto and quickly progressed into building new single home builds and renovation jobs. In 2010, Sherry created Spotlight Development, specializing in the acquisition of properties for redevelopment into high density residential, commercial, and mixed use projects. An advocate for collaboration, she champions inclusivity and teamwork as a foundation for a successful approach towards real estate development. In 2019, Sherry partnered with Urban Capital to create Reina, the project with Canada's first all-female development team to raise awareness of gender inequality in the industry and many roles women can play. Welcome, Sherry. Wait until you hear about everyone's projects. They're just like phenomenal. Um, I'm not actually even done with Sherry's bio. Hold on. Uh, three years ago, she started the ARIA Foundation, a charitable organization that helps not-for-profit housing partners empower low-income families to become homeowners. Through her not-for-profit Spotlight Affordable Ventures, which we'll be talking about tonight, Sherry's building a complete community called The Inclusive. The Inclusive is the first of its kind, an affordable housing complex with multiple towers that includes services such as 24-hour daycare, job training, a food bank, and a Brands for Canada store with donated clo clothes and hygiene items. It will be built at Black Creek and Lawrence with funding coming from the ARIA Foundation. ARIA will be working with partners Habitat for Humanity, Trillium Housing, Black North, Wood Green Community Services, Good Shepherd, and Wigwamin. Her hope is to build the Inclusive project in several areas throughout the GTA in the coming years. Lots to talk about there. Lamont Wiltshire, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of the Wiltshire Group, as well as his lovely partner, Odine Eccleston, the President, Broker of Record, and the Co-Founder of the Wiltshire Group. In 2009, Lamont Wiltshire was an avid investor and Co-Founder and CEO of a thriving luxury car dealership. In 2009, Odine Eccleston was a recent University of Toronto graduate, there you go, uh, who had put her professional acting and modeling years behind her to become an investor and a recognizable name in Toronto real estate. The two young powerhouses would meet that very year, and with a mutual fervor for entrepreneurialism, real estate, and investing, they would soon join forces to start their own company together. Wiltshire Homes Canada, Inc., what began as a, as a few small property rehabilitations, soon grew into a full-fledged custom home building business. Today, the Wiltshire Group consists of a conglomerate of real estate-related enterprises, including Wiltshire Homes, Wiltshire Eccleston Developments, and We Realty. I said we, but I'm not sure if you pronounce it that way. We'll talk about that later. Uh, a real estate brokerage that provides residential and commercial real estate services to the public, including purchasing, selling, investing, building, and leasing. Wiltshire serves as the company's CEO, and Odin Lamont serves as the company's CEO, and Odin is the president and broker of record. Welcome. And last but not least, we have Marcel Gros, who is a real estate entrepreneur and co-founder of Onabili. You might Onably. have to Onably. 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 <laughs> so Marcel is an entrepreneur, he's a philanthropist, and he's the co-founder of a prop tech startup, Onably. Previously, Marcel founded Garrison Alternative Asset Management Inc. and Garrison Capital Corporation. His passion for real estate was initially sparked almost 20 years ago when he purchased his first investment property, and now Marcel is a domain expert. This combination of experience and obsession with innovation and community are what drives him to solve the big industry challenges out there today. Marcel is an active member of the Urban Land Institute, the PropTech Collective, and the Canadian Mortgage Brokers Association. Marcel is dedicated to youth education, and through his work with the Grow Family Foundation, in partnership with imagineonday.org, he has helped to fund the building of an early educational schools across rural Ethiopia. Welcome, Marcel. All right, so we have three hours worth of conversation in 40 minutes, so we'll get started. So first, a question for everyone. You know, we just want the audience to learn a little bit more about who you are, 
a little bit about you, how did you become a real estate developer? And just tell us a little bit about that journey to get you know, to where you are today. And I'm looking at Marcel, because you're right here. So maybe we'll start yeah. off with you. Sure. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, good night. Um, I would say the way I got started was um, really just a passion for exploring this why that I had. And the why or, or the chapter that I was in in my life at that time was, um, you know, I just graduated from school from Ryerson, I'm now TMU, and um, I went into advertising and marketing and really kind of figured out that I didn't want to be like an employee or work for someone. Um, I was an entrepreneur at heart from the beginning. And um, my first boss gave me this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it kind of transformed, you know, the way I thought about, um, you know, kind of like life from that perspective of work, right? Instead of exchanging my time, um, I wanted to buy assets and, uh, and, and kind of create my own lifestyle. So um, it's not the book that was important, but it's the people that were in your life and who showed up um, that I want to get across for that, with that point. So um, for me, like, it was this why that I had. And, um, and I wrote it down, and I remember... You know, in my days when I was doing this stuff, I'm old, um, it, there, there weren't many people that looked like me. Um, you know, I was probably, you know, the second black guy in the room and maybe one black girl. Um, and um, I'll, I'll never forget the, the day that we wrote this why. It was called Your Personal Belize. And there were like 700 investors in a, in a big room. And they called me up on stage. I, I showed the, the, what I wrote to the, to the organizer. And he called me up on stage, and I read it in front of 700 people. And it was like, it wasn't like, oh, I want to be a millionaire and all this stuff. Like, it was like, I want to build schools in Ethiopia, and I want to, you know, have free time to do this and that, and, you know, have, you know, just really control my life. And that's what it was. And it was like, by the time I was 31, like, I did it. And it was like, wow, right? And, and then from there, it's kind of like, okay, now you set the bar higher, right? So... Yeah, that, that's what it was. And if I could encourage anyone today, you've got to write that why. Because it's going to get tough. It's going to get really tough. A lot of people are going to say no. Banks are going to say no. Um, you know, you're going to be, there's going to be obstacles. And it's the why that gets you over that, right? So I hope that helps. Oh, that's great. And actually, before we move off of you, Marcel, I'm going to ask you quickly one more question. Yeah. What was your first project? Yeah, my first project, so I'll, I'll never forget this. And when we say real estate developments, I think we should context that because I've done small scale and larger scale. So, But I started off small scale. I would advise most people, unless you have mommy and daddy money, start off small scale. Um, so it was a duplex. Um, it was, I remember the address. It was 137 Day Avenue. And then we bought another one, 53 Seaborn. That was in Brampton. And they were both duplexes. And that's how I got my start. I did joint ventures. So I would go to people that had money. Um, I think at the time I was making like 45 grand my first job. And so I would just network and go to people that had money. And I told them, I'm the expert. This is what I do. I would draw. I literally had this like piece of paper. I would draw a T and I'd write out everything that I'm going to do. And I wrote out everything they had to do. And there was, their line was like two things, bring money and apply for mortgage. And my, my side of the page was like, you know, manage the property, give you financial statements, renovations, and it was like 50 lines, right? So that's how I raise money. Yeah. Okay, so many threads to pull. We're going to go to you, Lamont, or, well, yeah, we'll go, to, we'll go to Lamont. Yeah, so um, how I got into real estate is just a passion. Uh, I uh, wanted to have financial freedom. It started off that. I was always a bit of a hustler in my younger days. And um, 17, 18, I started my first business. is in the car industry. Uh, grew that and bloomed that into uh, a successful business that, that got changed into eventually real estate because I knew that's where the passion was. Um, always liked kind of the designing and the construction of it. Knew there is a, a fair bit of, uh, I guess, uh, you could be very successful in the industry is, is what I always knew. So... I said, let me start with something that I'm passionate about, something that I like, and uh, something that, that, that makes, makes sense. And it's a simple concept. Real estate's been around since, you know, since we've been alive on this planet, I think, from some shape or form. So, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And uh, really, um, with my first project I started with was uh, 
uh, actually, um, I want to buy a condo. Uh, saved up enough money to buy a condo when I was about 19 or 20. Um, my dad was an entrepreneur, so always had a, uh, you know, some, some knowledge from there and uh, wanted to go downtown and do the whole live my dream and have fun. But <laughs> I, uh, he's walking on the street and actually seen an old dilapidated house. And it's funny because I didn't see the vision in it. And this is where the knowledge comes in, right? Like, knowledge is key. So I was going to buy a condo. Um, I ended up buying this old dilapidated house, didn't understand the concept, said rent it out. And uh, I think you should build on it. He knew a little bit about building. He said, yeah, you teach me the skills to build. And when I'm ready, you know, get the money and, and start. And that's exactly what I did. Um, rented it out for two years. Um, put the money together with just some private funding and, and expensive money. Um, but whatever it took to do it at the time. And uh, jumped in, built my first house. Met Odin. She sold it. And uh, the rest is kind of... Wait, that's how you met? <laughs> we, she we, sold that house? The, the first house well. that, that, that I built... Yeah. Um, I uh, found what I thought was, at the time, the, the most popular, best realtor that I knew. <laughs> and uh, I uh, used it as an excuse to say, hey, I got a nice house that I could show off. It's a custom-built house. It's called stunting, guys. It's, it's stunting a little bit. I was flexing. Uh, young, though. Young, right? And um, uh, it's extremely expensive flex, right? It is an flex, expensive right? flex, yes. but, but nevertheless, I met her, and the knowledge that I got, I was blown away with the knowledge she knew about the home. And it took about two or three years to kind of get around for me selling this asset. But um, she can kind of finish off the story. But when she came in, um, she had a great plan. It was, uh, it ended up breaking a record on that street that sat for a couple years after that. And uh, she got the job done, and I was sold. And my trust has been in her ever since. And, 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 and that's it. That's how we kind of started our company. Well, there's so many more questions there, but I think we're going to go to Odin. Odin, you want to want to tell us a little bit about your journey and, and pick up where the story left sure. off as well? Sure. So I'll start with um, when I was around um, 18 years old. So, and since we are talking about like um, just like uh, how things happen, both of my parents were and still are real estate invest investors, right? So I was seeing, since I was a very young child, the possibility. It was very natural to me. In fact, one of the properties that my dad bought, he put it in my name. So that's when we were, when I was about 18 years old. So I bought my first property with my dad at 18, right? So just even learning the process of purchasing and selling, uh, was, it was, I, I, was, I was privileged to do that at a, at a young age. Then I went to University of Toronto for something totally different, English and psychology. And in my final year here at U of T, I was like, wait a minute, what am I, what am I gonna do? I don't think I wanna get my master's. And my dad also had a short stint as a realtor. And so I said, you know what? I'm gonna get my license to help him out. Um, so I got my license by the, t by the time that I graduated here, I had my, my real estate license. And then I got rookie of the year with um, the brokerage that I was with. And that's how Lamont heard of me. <laughs> and then, um, uh, yeah, so he and I met. And I had invested in another property. He, bought, he built that one. When I sold that, I also sold a condo that I had purchased. And then we amalgamated our resources to flip our first home. So that's how it, or it was a small flip. It was a townhouse. Um, and we flipped homes for several years, but then we couldn't find any more houses to flip, so we took a leap of faith and built our first custom home. And um, it kind of snowballed from there, where uh, now we've built almost, almost 100 homes um, when you factor in the small subdivisions that we've been able to build over the years as well. So picking up from his story to, yeah. Beautiful, awesome. We're going to go to Sherry, and then we're going to weave all of this together because there's, there's so many commonalities here. Sure. So um, I was actually born in a family that real estate investment didn't really exist. Um, being a doctor or a dentist was the only way to go or nothing else. So I actually went through, universe, uh, through high school studying biology, you know, and unfortunately getting into the biology program in university <laughs> and hating myself for it every day. And... Um, you know, my actually was my dad was actually very proud because he got me a job as a dent as a volunteer at a dental office, and my first patient was actually my brother getting a root canal. So it was some of the worst experiences of my life uh, going through, you know, working in a dental office and working on your brother's mouth for like an hour. 
And um, I decided that, you know, being in university, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just not go to any of my classes. So I did that. I just stopped going to classes. We had a great group of people just like me who did not want to go to school, and they all played cards in the cafeteria. So York University cafeteria was famous for that. So we sat there every day. I still went to school, don't get me wrong. Every morning, I was dropped off at university, and I was picked up at the end of the day, and um, I mastered the game of cards, different ones, different games. And um, when my, as they call report cards came, I had flunked all of my courses, including biology. So my father literally sat down, because he'd been through that with me throughout my whole life, because I wasn't always the best student. I was always a troublemaker. So he looked at me, and he's like, what's your plan? I said, I just don't like this. This is not for me. And he's like, well, I'll give you six months. You get into the program. You, and he's like, what do you want to do? I said, architecture. He's like, yeah, you're meant to go on construction sites anyway. So you, say, I'll give you six months. You get into the program. You can do whatever you want. If you don't get into that program, <clears throat> you're going to have to come back, go to medical school, and you're going to finish. I said, OK, no problem. Six months, no art background, no physics, no nothing. I went through school, night school, took physics, um, you know, did my art portfolio. I got into the architecture program and civil engineering program at Ryerson. And I came to my dad and I said, sorry, dad, architecture it is. And um, from there on, you know, I had crazy dreams about what architecture would be like. I thought, this is me designing these beautiful homes and these beautiful buildings. And I came out of university, and I got hired at my first job. And lo and behold, all I did was do CAD on a computer every day. And I was miserable. And at that time, I married at a very young age. I was actually married. So I think <clears throat> my misery started to show um, so that you know, my first, um, the first person who believed in me and actually trusted me and actually saw some potential in me was my father-in-law. Um, so he came to me and he's like, you just really don't like this. And I said, no, I really don't. And he's like, okay, well, I'll invest in you if you find a good piece of land and um, you're able to actually buy it at a decent price. It was my first project. I bought a single family home in Villadale West. Um, he gave me um, the funding to build it. And I remember my father calling me and saying, I know that you're getting the support, but don't worry if anything goes wrong, I'll cover you. And I said, thank you. I hope that's never going to happen. But that word of confidence and the fact that I had someone back me up, it was obviously, you know, doubled because it was my father and I believe in me and it was my father <clears throat> who said, go, go and do it. Uh, but, you know, first and foremost, my father in law because he put the hard money down. And I think I made him not, you know, regret that decision. So I... Um, I built the first home, um, you know, and it was a custom home. I designed it. I called myself the site supervisor, garbage collector, um, you know, mover, absolutely anything you want on a job site. I would literally move drywalls because my guys wouldn't move it, so I wanted to make sure that they do, they do it. And the moment I would go and start moving it, they would actually go and start, you know, doing what I wanted them to do. So a typical, you know, men story <laughs> but it was just this, it was just a funny thing on the job site I was um, a young woman pink heart hat pink shoes on a job site um, not getting the treatment I expected as a boss on a job site obviously because people would literally pass by me and go talk to the next guy who was my painter on a job site because he was a man and just ignore me and um, many other instances of stories that happened from you know people that were around me. But eventually, I did that for about 15, 16 homes. And I said, this is still not good. It's not satisfying. So I bought more land. I bought bigger land. I made investments. I made money on those investments. I told my family, it's mine. I'm not giving it back. So I used them. I bought bigger pieces of property. I did subdivisions, um, very small ones. I sold them. And my eyes were always on a condo site. So I went and I bought my first condo site. And I put my family in a position where I said, I bought it. We kind of have to close it now. And they're like, well, you have no experience. So I said, I will get a partnership. And I started to build partnerships. I started to do, to go around, look for partners, knocked at the doors. I literally cold called developers that I had searched on the internet for. 
and I knew what they were doing. I cold called many of them. And Urban Capital and my friend Taya, who's sitting here, and my partner from Reina, is one of those offices that I actually cold called. And I said, um, I have a property next to your site. I really like your building. Do you think you want to partner with me? And David Wex from Urban Capital literally thought I was a crazy woman. She's like, he's like, okay, well, I'll give you five minutes. Come and let me see what you want to do. Eventually, I made partnerships. I made partnerships with very large developers. I actually now have a 60-story at a corner of Queen and Church with a uh, with center court development. I have um, an 18-story with Liberty, which is my first site that I bought. I have, um, you know, a Reina condo, which is my pride and joy with my partner, Taya, where we did, we hired all females. There wasn't many of us, or there, was, there wasn't any of us. Literally, me, m me and Taya usually were the females, the only females in the rooms that we were at. So, um, it wasn't, it, you know, it didn't work that well. So just to cut the story short, we made that project. We made a mark in the industry. We proved that we're here, we're here to stay. And then recently with my affordable housing project, which is again another collaboration with all these non-for-profit organizations where we're building about, at this point in the pipeline, we have about 5,000 units of affordable housing that we're bringing into the community in the form of um, creating complete communities. And that's it. I'm sorry. I, no. I cut it short. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I think, you know, all of you are so accomplished, have stories that many of us would aspire to with your career success. But I think we all know also, and, and people alluded to it, entrepreneurship is not, you know, just all a bed of roses. It's you know, not just a, a steady upward trajectory. There's, there's losses, there's setbacks, there's you know, knocks that you have to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and keep going from. And so one of the things we're hoping you could share with the audience is could you talk about one part of your career where things went wrong, where it was maybe not a disaster, but things collapsed, they, they, they didn't turn out the way that you wanted. Tell us about one of those losses along this entrepreneurship journey, and maybe how did you learn from that, or how did it help shape you and your success in the future as an entrepreneur? Anyone who'd like to start? Um, I'll start. Um, so yeah, being an entrepreneur, you go through a lot of ups and downs, that's for sure. So I think I can go back to a story uh, that happened to us back in 2017. So we were growing the companies small company at that time, mom and pop-ish, and uh, we're buying up everything and selling everything, and times are good. If anybody remembers that 2013, 14, 15, 16 run, up to 17, everybody's making money. So this is uh, the case for us. So um, we're doing good. Anything you touch in real estate, you're doing well on, whether you're flipping, building, whatever. So uh, I think uh, uh, you, you grow a bit of a, a, a certain type of confidence when you, when you get to that point, and... Uh, you almost feel slightly invincible, like you cannot lose money at that point, right? Um, and that's what happened with, with, with us, but more me, because I drove it. So we were ready to expand, and uh, this is when we bought, we bought an office building. And uh, we had a lot of properties on the go. We had about 15 properties on the go, and we were pretty overextended, but the money kept coming, and we kept going. Um, and then in 2017, uh, some changes happened to, to the real estate market where they did a lot of tightening in the industry, long and short. Um, and it just killed the industry. So everything overnight literally just stopped. Just like a miracle round, it just stopped. And uh, this office building we bought, um, we couldn't close on. It was pretty bad. And um, Odin was always kind of the voice saying, hey, you know what? We should chill, relax, and I'm like, no, 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 go, 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 go. I'm more conservative. Ex extremely more conservative, um, which I am now conservative at this point. <laughs> but long and short, we, we, we purchased this building. We could not close on it. It's the only property we've ever bought that we could not close on, and uh, we couldn't close on it. I couldn't sleep, eat for a little while, but... Um, when you sign a contract saying that you're gonna close on something and you don't, there are repercussions. In our case, we lost a good chunk of money. And the relationship that I had with that particular uh, homeowner and agent, they were actually like colleagues and friends of mine. So it was, um, yeah, it's an unfortunate situation, but it definitely taught us uh, the importance of being conservative. But with there is an end to the story. 
<laughs> so we, we did lose the deposit, and as I said, I couldn't think about it anyways. It forced us to restructure everything, clear off the properties, clear off the debt, get back into a more capital position so we could kind of ride the wave, right? Uh, fast forwarding now, the office building we bought, we would have outgrew in one year. I promise you, we would have outgrew in one year, right? So today, the office building we ended up buying two years ago um, can, can house really our whole company, right? It's, it's room for growth, and it's really a, a, a success story. But what I do, I do remember the moment is be a little bit more conservative. Don't be so bullish. Um, always check yourself. Have that second voice or that gut feeling just to have a little extra capital to get you through the rough markets as you go along. So that's a little bit of a kind of roundabout story on, on what's happened to us. I love it, and I love that insight into kind of your team and the different approaches you take and, and how you learn. And I think similarly, co-founding and co-running a business, having a business partner, having someone who can be like, mm, not sure that's the best idea in the world, maybe let's reel it in, is, is so essential. And I think maybe we'll talk about that a little later, how important it is about the company we keep as entrepreneurs and the team and the advice we have around us. But we'll open up. Go ahead, Z. I was just going to say, Kofi and I have a rule. Only one person gets to freak out at once. It's a very good rule. But I think, I think it's also just developing these principles so you can weather these, these kinds of major bumps that mess with your identity and they mess with your sense of self and all of the success you had built to date, right? It probably called some of that into to question. And so I think how doing it together, those dynamics really matter. Like it, it matters and we need to talk about it. And I will say it's the cheapest lesson I think we've ever had. Right. It, it sounded extremely expensive at the time, but the knowledge and what we've learned from that has probably saved us time and time and time again. So now I only get checked once a week instead of every other day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Marcel Sherry, is there a story you'd like yeah. to share? Love to. Um, so, I think um, similar to to my colleagues here, the the project that that caused me a lot of stress, like it was outside of like my normal kind of like run of the mill, which were like these duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. After I'd done a number of those, I think we got up to like around fifty or so. We kind of want to go big, so we want to be like developers now, right? Even though we technically were developers, just in a different way. Um, so we went to um, a few colleagues of mine um, went to this property that was a mid-rise. And um, if there, are there any developers in the, in the room? Like any, any, okay. So anyone that knows mid-rises, like they're very difficult projects, right? They're kind of, in the industry, they're kind of called one and dones, right? They're like, you do it once and like, that's it. You go to, straight to high rise. Um, so we went into this mid-rise project and, you know, I put my money in and my, my partners put their money in. And it was like we got to the closing date, and once again, we couldn't close. And I'm, I'll never forget this meeting, like meeting the, meeting the, um, the seller um, at, his, at his home. Like it was, I think it was like on a Sunday, and it was like a plead to give us some more time to close. And we eventually got, um, I think it was another 45 days to close this project. And he insert this clause, and I'll never forget it, because now I have it in my back pocket. It's called a quit claim. Does anyone know what that is? Any lawyers in the room? Yeah? OK. So it basically means that if we didn't close, he could basically take the project from us without any, like, like there's no legal recourse we have. It's called a quit claim deed. Um, and now that I'll speak a little bit about it later, but now that we get into lending, like we, you know, we we look at this clause when, you know, things get bad, and you can you can kind of um, you can pull it out, and that's how you can you can take the property back from someone. So very like we didn't know what it was at the time, um, and um, you know we went around from developer to developer, and it's very difficult to you know arrange partnerships with developers because it's a dog eat dog world, especially when they see that you couldn't close, and they they smell a little bit of blood. Um, they're, they're all over you, right? So the negotiations are very tough. Um, we ended up being able to bring in an investor and a lender that gave us a little bit more money than we, you know, than most would um, because of the location of the project and we, we were able to close it. Um, but one of the things I learned which kind of sparked the business model for my future developments was I was really interested in the state of the property that the developer was selling to us. Um, and he was selling it at what's called draft plan. 
Um, if it, does anyone know what that means? Yeah, okay, so there's a developer. So um, there's still a long way to go after draft plan, right? Like we thought it was like, yeah, this is ready to go, you know, we're shovels in the ground. Um, but you know, from draft plan, you know, you still gotta go to site plan, and then from there, you gotta apply for building permits. And in the city of Toronto, that like, you know, just is forever, right? Um, no pun intended. But so, so, um, so I was really interested in what the, what the developer did. Basically, he bought this land raw and got it to a state and then sold it to us for a price. And I was like, we found out what he bought the land for and that floored me. So my business model going forward and this kind of the lessons that I learned from this deal was I wanted to do that. I didn't want to get my hands dirty with you know, large construction. What I wanted to do was buy well. And that was my business model for the development. So we started knocking on doors, assembling, pro assembling properties, and really focusing on the entitlement process, which is like the rezoning. So getting the rezoning um, in place and then selling it to a builder um, with a certain margin. And knowing what builders need um, as a margin, we're able to capture a lot of the value in the properties. Um, so that was when, that was before the, the rezoning and entitlement process kind of got out of hand. Um, and um, that was, uh, that was a, look, a very lucrative model and it still is. You know, Marcel, when we had the prep call, you, you had a quote that's been sitting in my mind. You said, there's nowhere you can lose your shirt, like in real estate development. Yeah, and, and yeah, when, when you're ready for me to get real, like, yeah, you want to lose your now, shirt? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I only got one shirt on, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's, you know, that, that really puts into focus the, I can just imagine for, for both of those stories, the emotions and the stress and what that, you know, I think about, you know, when I get a gas bill that I don't expect, and, it's come, and you stress out about, but to have a property you can't close on and think about the reputation, the money, and all those pieces, I mean, it, it, it's clear to me there's a degree of fortitude and kind of composure that must be essential for this to kind of not lose your head, to not panic, to take those 40 days and figure out how to close it and make the right strategic decisions. And so... You got to have a strong stomach. Yeah. Yeah. So on that note, Sherry, what, what do you want to share with so us? I echo everything that uh, my colleagues here were saying, except that I think I have put myself in that situation, not to ever not close, but I've put myself in a situation where I had to go and make sure that I buy myself more time because I always went for bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, sleepless nights were definitely part of it. But I think I like the thrill of that. And I think it just goes with my personality of being not conservative at all. So unfortunately, it kind of <laughs> leads me to a different direction. But I think as um, when I was, you know, doing smaller projects, doing single family homes and building for, um, you know, end users, I think the, the, I would like to share that side of the story with you because a lot can go wrong when you don't hire the right contractors, you don't have the right team, and you're not working with the right group, and when you actually take on too many projects at once. So <clears throat> forgive me, I have a, a little bit of a cold, so <clears throat> please bear with me. But um, I remember when I had three or four or five projects that were on the go at the same time, when I did not have enough of the good contractors that I could send from one project to another, it was always a problem making sure the job is being done on time and it's being done at the quality that you want it to be done. And I think, you know, you kind of create your reputation, especially if you have clients that you're building for, with the people that you hire and the people who actually implement the job on a job site. And it's so easy to ruin, ruin your own reputation, and I, and I do remember. And it's funny because the guy who did that to me was just arrested by police two months ago for frauding a lot of builders for the work he does because he was frauding insurance. <clears throat> I hired him to do <clears throat> work at a site where we finished the house beautifully, designed top notch, and it was one of my projects from many years ago, and I, and I loved the homeowners. And um, we literally handed over the key, and these guys were the last groups that were in the house. There was two or three guys that were you know, lurking around saying, we're going to finalize this, we're going to finish this. We left the house, and I remember, I think it was, I don't know, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning, where I'm used to getting calls at 6 o'clock, but only from my framer who wanted to scream because lumber wasn't there on site. But I got a call from 
the homeowner who said, my basement is full of water. It's just like a pool, and I'm sw I can swim in it. And I literally remember how I felt and how bad I felt about that experience and what has happened. And I think every time that you do something for someone else that doesn't turn out the way yet, that you promised them to, it leaves a scar. And, you know, in a smaller project, it happens so much easier than a larger project. Um, and I think it left me, um, it left a hole inside me because I never got to explain to that homeowner that I had done my best and it was something that was out of my control. Because in reality, it should not have been out of my control. It should have been fully under my control. I should have been more diligent in the people I hired. I should have been more diligent on a job site. I should have paid attention to every move. I should have still been the last person leaving the job site as I used to. And um, I still remember that project. And I, what I would recommend to everyone is that you kind of define yourself by the people you hire and the people you bring on board to help you do your projects. And I think that was the turning point for me to say, no more, no more single family homes, no more small projects, um, because I could not find the group of trusted contractors to do those projects. So that's basically my ex worst experience. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, I think you modeled that example in the all female development project, which is actually the direction we want to go in. But you know, just before we do, I was just listening to all of you, and you said you use the language, Sherry, of leaving a scar. Mm -hmm. Um, before we launched this program, we did, like, as Kofi mentioned, we did about a year of research just mapping the experiences of racialized folks in real estate development. And there's one story that I don't think has left both, like, both either Kofi or I that, um, some folks in the audience who read the round table might remember. There was one man who was, you know, in the trades and he's like, I've, I've been trying to get into development, I've been trying to do this work. And because the banks were not warm, uh, you know, traditional banks were not that warm to a first-time entrepreneur, even though this, this man had tons of skills. Like, he, he knew how to build homes. He went to an alternative lender. And when he went to the alternative lender, you know, he had a $30,000 loan, he, or he had a loan, he showed up five minutes late to pay it back, and it was a $30,000 fee. And that basically got him out of the game, right? That was a scar that never left him. And I think, you know, we've been thinking a lot about, okay, there, there are these barriers. How, how, how do we support people to move through them? And you all have these stories of like, and then what happened next? And so, you know, we've heard a lot of stories about folks who, you know, right out of the gate, they get stopped on their first project. And so, you know, just hearing about how you continue to work through it is so, so, so helpful. And it's these stories that we actually need more of. And so we're going to go a little bit deeper just with Sherry and Odine because, you know, and Sherry, you mentioned in your opening remarks, you know, we know that there are barriers in this space. We are aware. We are aware that racialized folks experience barriers getting into real estate development. We also are aware that if you are racialized and you are a woman, you know, there are, the barriers are extremely significant. And so you both have done such a tremendous job of continuing to build such incredible profile and have such incredible impact. And we just want to get a sense of the barriers you've encountered and how you, you know, nurtured your capacity to continue to, to sort of move through them? So where do I start? Because <laughs> they're at every step of the way. And um, I still think that, um, you know, we still have a very long way to go to tackle this issue. Um, and it's, you know, it's not anywhere close to being resolved. And um, it's funny because when we started the um, all-female uh, development project, you know, there were so many mixed messages that we were getting, so many comments that, you know, I remember me and Taya used to like message each other and say, did you read this? Did you read that? And we were shocked and in awe. But I'll tell you, one of the worst ones that I received personally was when I um, had my office and I was doing the single family homes, I had hired these young um, kids, where I called them young kids because they were younger than me. And um, they were just out of school, and they were looking for a job. I hired this guy um, who was just out of George Brown College. I brought him in, and I taught him the way to help me get the permits, move the, um, the, the projects ahead as far as getting the permits and whatnot. And eventually, after a couple of years, he had a kid. He decided to work from home when work from home was not a thing, right? So uh, it didn't work for me. I wanted the presence in the office, and I had other staff. So... 
you know, I said, we put it away, you know, without any problems. When my projects got announced and then the newspaper articles started to come, I remember my assistant sent that article to the people that used to work for us or were part of the team. And the message that he sent back was this um, sort of uh, snapshot of an of a article that said, um, the bridge collapsed because of the de design, the, the engineer that was a female somewhere in the world, and I, uh, somewhere in the US. I don't exactly remember. I, I still vividly remember the image, but I can't remember the words. But it was, and then he sent that and he said, haha, watch their building you know, collapse because their engineers are women. I literally read that and I thought to myself, I taught you everything you know about this business. I took you under my wings and I taught you how to do it. And this is someone who worked for me for many years. And, you know, that's not it. That's not the only way. On a job site, I did say, you know, one of the stories about the guys, you know, passing by me and going and talking to the painter. But I literally had a, a plumber run after me with a metal, like a, a pipe to hit me because I told him that you're not putting something in a proper place. There is... The discrimination is physical, it's emotional, it's absolutely in any way you can imagine. So for us to stand up for our, for our rights, for us to fight for what's, what we deserve, it's not easy. And these examples of stories that I'm telling you, I'm not the only one who has to live with them or has been through them. I've been through it a little bit worse just because I put myself out there more than other people. But if I didn't put myself out there, I wouldn't be where I am right now. And as I grew in the business, believe me, it even got harder and harder. Misogyny in the development industry, them thinking that because you're a woman, you can't strike a deal, and you being a woman can't get this deal done, is continuously happening in our industry from the closest people to us. And on the other hand, there are those who support you. So there's two ways to the story. So I can't sit here and tell you that the crazy guy who ran after me, who was my dad's age with a pipe, is, is you know, that's how everyone should be perceived. But I tell you, they exist. But what they do to like, a person like me is they just make me stronger. And they make me feel like I want to go um, and, and, and fight the fight and, and get to where I want to get um, with uh, more of a sort of, uh, like, just fight for it more, like just not give up. But I also needed the support of all those people that were around, all those people that were um, there to help me. And I always use this example uh, of my, my partner that I cold called. And you know, it was a funny story because he said, come and meet me. And, and I met with him and I tell him he was one of the best cold calls I ever made because he became a mentor. He still calls me crazy at times. He says, Sherry, you're crazy for doing whatever you're doing, but he still supports me. And you know, th th those people also exist. They help you grow, they help you prosper, but the problems in our industry for women are not being resolved. Whether it is at the table, at the negotiation table, whether it is at construction sites, whether it is in a boardrooms, in meetings, or if it is dealing with financing. They look at you, you're young, you don't come with a background, you're a woman, well, you know what, come back to me in 30 years when you have a track record. Well, hopefully in 30 days I don't need you. That's usually my answer. But Thank unfortunately, you. that's the problem in our industry. And let's just say, as much as people think it's getting better, I think it's not getting better. Because we still have to give awards for people doing inclusion and equality and all of these things as a model for their company. That is a problem, and we should, we should definitely think about it. Thank you. So I came here today, obviously, to be transparent, yeah. right? So <clears throat> obviously, um, racism, um, sexism, ageism, very real. And especially, I think, um, being black, in Canada, um, it, it's, it can be that much more difficult. Um, and as Sherry mentioned, with financing, I've seen some of my, my own like friends and counterparts that are white males, um, or even my clients that are white males, I've sent, I've sent them to the bank, and they get the financing quicker 
than you know somebody else could. I also, um, you know, th there's just there's plenty of examples. I've seen appraisals happen at, where I will literally like if it, if it's owned by a black man, sometimes I'll have to get it reappraised and have somebody else meet the appraiser at the house and it gets appraised higher. So this is this is real and we know it's, it exists. However, I think a part of my personal success is that I've never really looked at it as an impediment. Mm. And that's just me being honest. Since I was a child, mm. I've, ne I've always thought that I'm lucky to be a woman or a girl. I've always been like very happy to be a girl and happy to be black, happy to be the culture that I am and proud, right? And so then I think if you, um, if you uh, approach things from a perspective of pride and confidence, and yes, that might mean or does mean that I have to work harder in this day and age, right? But I'm not gonna lament about me having to work harder. I'm just gonna do it. So I, I'm sure you know we're working in strides to, to have that change. But the reality is, if I have to work harder and lament the same, we're, we are going to do that. And so then I think that. Um, we, we can't sugarcoat that. We have to be that much better as black people. We have to be that much more diligent, um, that much more transparent. And, it, and thankfully though, you build those relationships, you build the trust of the financiers, of the clients, of the community, and then I, we're still you know, on the rise, God willing. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a hopeful note to transition to our last question. I mean, I should say that we, we need way more time with all of you. And I think just as I'm listening to all of you, one of the things we kept hearing about as we, and just being proximate to the development industry in, in our work and in the communities that we, we engage with, you know, this is where the change happens, right? Like, you know, there are so many workarounds within the development industry just in general, that are getting swapped all the time between people who are in the know. And so these kinds of circles aren't happening where racialized folks are participating in them and saying, what are you doing on your site? You know, even so, as I'm, as I'm listening to all of you, I think that's, that's what's coming clear is that, you know, I think we need more circles to swap, swap some of the trade secrets to get these things done as, as we push the industry to change so that we don't have to live and work around, right? And so... So, no, we appreci appreciate you both sharing. I'll pass it to Kofi yeah. for the last question. So on the note of trade secrets yeah. and connecting as a community, I would invite everyone afterwards, there'll be some food and a chance for us to network and share ideas with each other. So please stick around for that. But kind of shifting gears, we mentioned how from our work and being in this space, people talked about development being this black box, saying maybe I know one piece of the puzzle, like you know, I I'm a GC, I know how to get it built. But permitting is, is just doesn't make sense to me, or folks who understand financing, but the other aspects of it and kind of you know moving through the construction process is new to them. And people want to put these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. So to help folks with that tonight and rapid fire, because we want to have a few questions from the audience, I'm gonna ask each of you and just maybe take two minutes max, give us one trade secret, one technical tip that you would have for folks in the audience today who are thinking about doing their first development project, what's one technical tip, what's one trade secret that you think it's critical for them to keep in mind? I mean, we'll start from Marcel and just move our way down. Yeah, sure. Um, so if I could say one trade secret, um, it would be stress tests your projects. So when I, when I did you know, a lot of these duplexes and fourplexes and stuff, um, you know, uh, and you got to be careful with realtors, right? They'll always push you because they're incentivized to sell the property. Um, so make sure you're stress testing. So, you know, I remember back when rates were, when I was doing stuff like, you know, rates were in the threes or whatever. Like I was stress testing at five, right? Five and a half. Um, and just, I had a really good understanding of financing because I had that mortgage background. But yeah, stress test your, your, your projects. Um, and, and, it, and include all the line items. Don't make the Excel sheet work. Like, include everything, like bookkeeping, insurance, like, get it all in there, right? Like, don't make it work on paper because it guaranteed won't work in real life. Yeah, your estimates being one place, it really pays to be conservative. Yeah, yeah, be conservative. Mm -hmm. Lamont. 
Yeah, agreed with Marcel. Um, stress test, stress test your projects. Uh, something that like we always do is uh, we make sure when we do any project, usually development projects when we're buying land, uh, make sure we can uh, take a twenty percent, twenty five percent hit on on the project. So can I still make money on this project if the market changes next year and there's a twenty five percent upside down number? Can I at least still break even? That's very important. Um, that's if you have money though and you have capital. If you have no capital, which is fine. I always say it's important to structure the deal. A lot of times deals are like the money's made on the buy, hence when we start with the real estate. So you always make money on the buy and if you have no capital, there's uh, constructive ways to structure the deal, whether you use VTBs, whether you use JV partners. What's a VTB? <laughs> What's a JV partner? Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. So VTB is a vendor take back, so if, um, uh, say a property is a million dollars, right? And you only have, I shouldn't say only, if you, if you have saved up enough money, say $50,000, which is awesome, and you can't get a mortgage from a bank, you can't go to a hard lender like a private, go to that seller, and it's always better to do it in lower markets that are not strong. Go to that seller, say, hey, can you give me a mortgage for the 950 so I can close on it at a rate of say 10%, 9%, 8%, close on the deal, and it's cheaper than bringing in a partner doing a VTB, and it allows you not to have to go to the bank, show financials, it's trust in your word. And to get a VTB, you need to know your project well. So I always say, know your project inside and out. Like, understand it, know it, stress test it, right? Know what you're doing, have the confidence from the person who you're looking for the VTB to do, um, to, so, so they'll lend you the money. And then a joint venture is if you can't do a VTB, maybe you can get some partners together. Um, it's, it's a joint venture, it's a JV, so, uh, you guys can all pull your money together, right? Start small, put your money into a project. Um, what I would say, invest in experience. I, I would not say to do the project unless you have experience. If you're gonna invest any money in the project, get experience in the project, it'll get you through. Because if you don't get out your first one, you probably never go back and do it again. Get through the first project. So those are my little tips for, uh, for that. I love it, that start small and build your confidence and it snowballs from there. Sarah, are we looking to jump in? Yeah. Okay, Odin. Have a takeout for that VTB too. Because the kiss of death in real estate is too much debt. If you're going you're to lose your shirt again, it's going to be debt. Right? So cash over debt. Thank you, Odin. And the other acronym that Lamont mentioned was JV, and that's joint venture. Um, so I would say that one of my um, like a trade tip, uh, there are consultants out there that, are, that focus on doing performas, which are analyses of, analyses rather, of uh, prospective deals and we have we're very fortunate to have very good relationships with these types of consultants so um, yeah so first of all doing a performa but especially having it reviewed or even done by the types of by consultants that focus on that can be very helpful thank you Sharon well obviously everything that everyone else said holds true and and, and very important but I also think that the first and the most important thing you can do is to pick the right location. Um, don't just buy something because it's cheap and you can afford it. Make sure what you buy is in a location that if anything happens, you still hold the value of your property. I think that's very important because it doesn't always happen that you end up finishing a project. So your property needs to have a value without your um, sort of um, big sort of idea on it. So it's very important for you to do something in a location that's um, you know, sought after so that in the worst case scenario, if you know, that kiss of death comes to you and you end up with a lot of debt or you have, you know, low on, you're low on cash, your property still holds its value. And I think to me that's very important, picking the right locations for the property, um, even if it means paying a little bit more obviously not a crazy amount, but buying a smaller project in a better location for the same price that you could buy a bigger project somewhere else. Um, and um, being creative. Don't do the same thing that the next door neighbor is doing. Don't just copy and paste. Try to bring in some innovation. Try to bring in some you know, different type of thinking into the business of real estate. Try to bring something where differentiates you from the other next door neighbor, the next door developer, the next door, um, you know, whoever they are that are building in the industry. 
Um, it's, it's always good for other people to copy you, but it's not always good for you to copy someone else because the value, you lose the value when you do that. So I think that little bit of innovation and creativity goes a very long way, especially on a property that you bought at a very good location and a good price. Very cool. Thank you, everyone. Well, on that note, uh, we've been seeing a lot of this over the course of the evening. There's a lot of head nodding. So we have time. I'm looking. How many questions? Three. Oh, my God. I was going to say two. All right. Three questions. Um, can we? And we have a roving mic that's coming around. So we have a question over there. And we just ask if you specify which of our fabulous panelists you'd like to respond. That'll help make sure we have room for everyone's question of the three. Good evening, everyone. Uh, really great insights. I have a question about accessing tax liens, right? And I've been doing my own research in the Gazette. Any insights on the do's and don'ts? Because we know getting access to the land at an affordable price, especially now, is really difficult. I, I think I'd like to say something about that. I usually never, ever found my properties on MLS or anywhere where everybody else looks at. Uh, many times, I have looked at areas. I have looked at potential in those areas, and I went after assembling the properties, meaning putting some of the properties together and creating my own site. That's when you can win, because when you go after something that somebody's already done the work on, and it is for everyone to see, you're, you're one step behind, and you're not there to be able to get the best advantage of, of that piece of property. But when you can cr figure out where the areas are that are growing, that are prospering, that are sought after, go next to them. You don't always have to go there. Go right next to it, because as it's growing, it will move into that area. And try to buy something that nobody else wants to touch. And go after that, buy it at a very good price, and then try to put together more properties and make it a big, nice site. And by big, I don't mean um, a condo site, but I mean whatever it is that you're after, you're better off going after something that everybody else isn't looking after. And um, I think you have a very good chance at, at making it work. Great, thank you. We'll go to our next question. Right in the middle, Riza. Jack? Sure. <clears throat> I'm on. Uh, so actually, to touch on to your answer that you gave, I had a question for you guys, because you guys are all developers. How do you go about, uh, A, acquiring land? How do you convince those landowners to sell to you? And thirdly, do you look at the zoning and planning of like the official plan prior to approaching those landowners in those areas? So yes, but I will leave it to some of my yeah, other it, colleagues. Yeah, whoever wants to answer. I'll, I'll take this one, please. So if, um, if, if that's what you, you want to get into, larger projects, is that, is that what you're thinking? Uh, it can be a multi-project. Okay. So yeah, if you're, if you're getting into like assemblies, so you're more than just like a duplex or a triplex, like buying one property, but you're thinking like to assemble, um, definitely want to have um, some planning rationale behind what you're doing. Um, you know, absolutely want to have some planning rationale behind what you're doing um, because that will, that will determine how much you can pay for that land. So typically, like when, when we're approaching uh, individuals that own property and, you know, we're, we're delivering our thesis, um, you know, there's no games. There's, you know, there's no like, oh, you know, we're, you know, we're just here. We're thinking of buying. Your... It's kind of like, no, we want to buy your property. We're going to develop it. Like, this is, this is our plan. And we'll pay you market plus 25% um, or whatever. But we have our planning rationale done um, to the extent of like a very conservative estimate um, that will, you know, not 100%, but based on the rules in place, um, we'll, we'll get approved, right? So we're not like trying to, I don't know, you know, go from employment to residential or something like that, right? Like it's very, you know, mixed use apartment neighborhoods. As a matter of fact, like what we like to do is search in you know, orange and red, which is apartment neighborhoods and, and mixed use, and find the lowest density in those in those um, in those um, zoning zoning areas. Right, um, therein lies the opportunity. Right, so yeah, absolutely want to have your planning planning rationale in place. Just to add to that, not everybody understands planning rationales. 
So if you're looking at buying a property from a, a very old couple who don't know anything about that and they have their personal attachment to that property, good luck doing that. It's going to be a difficult battle. So you have to find creative ways. Again, all goes back to creativity and your negotiation skills. I know one guy that I wanted to buy from took me seven years and he ended up dying. And his kids sold it to me the day after he passed away. So, you know, you have these hurdles. It's, in, it's, it's what you get yourself into, right? Stay away from but her. It, it happens. <laughs> Definitely stay away from me. I went at that door, knocked so many times that I think he eventually had a heart attack. <laughs> but... But uh, all jokes aside, like literally, uh, it, it took me, I owned the two properties next to him, so I was there. I, I didn't have anywhere to go. But, you know, and it was the worst thing because the price I was offering him, I bought it for quarter, like more than half a million less from the, from the kids the next day. So, you know, sometimes there's no good answer for that. But the planning rationale with the people that have an understanding definitely helps. <laughs> hey, it's Sherry's planning rationale. I like it. Um, all right, we're going to go to our final question, which was the gentleman over there. So I am uh, a son of an immigrant, and I'm sure many people here are in that group too. Uh, so the first question that came to my mind was all four of you mentioned um, the power networking. Um, you, uh, Marcel, sort of said, you know, rich dad, poor dad, the lesson you wanted people to take away was um, the power of who you know and people. Um, so I guess there's a big hurdle in real estate and developing. Um, I'm pretty new to the field. I've only been in less than a year. So, um, you know, how do you get over that hurdle of um, developing the relationships if you don't know anybody? And then second, it's a little bit different, but um, I really like the project, Sherry, on the affordable housing front. And uh, as somebody who grew up in affordable housing, I recently uh, participated in a project where we raised rents on an affordable housing project by $1,000 a month. A little bit guilty, but it's not my choice. And, um, you know, the, the fundamentals of supply and demand and the challenges in the housing market right now are flipping for, you know. Uh, so right now, I guess there's two questions. is uh, How do you overcome the hurdles of developing the relationships if you don't know anybody? And then second is um, housing market, residential market is changing so quickly. Interest rates are higher. And we have a lot of immigrants coming in. We need more affordable housing more than ever, yet we have 2% vacancy rates in apartments, so what do we do? So uh, yeah, it's a lot, sorry. I'll leave the first part to someone else to respond and I'll talk about this later. Um, yeah, just it's, it's hard to break into the development world. There's no like right or wrong answer because development is so capital intensive. All the developers up here know it takes a lot of capital to, to develop. Uh, something that you can do if your capital's not there, you haven't created partnerships with uh, people, is um, just, just uh, finding maybe a good mentor or trading your, like bartering, like bartering your, your time for, for knowledge. So if you can latch on to somebody who knows what they're doing, you got to learn the industry. Because once you learn the industry, you'll understand the way to go. I'm telling you, it's easier said than done. But once you learn the industry, you'll figure out how to kind of get to that next step to get your capital. Because it's very hard to, to secure capital. If you don't have, say, a family that, that can, can lend you money, or you don't have a bank that will just cut a check. And they're very tight. They won't do it. So you have to understand the knowledge. And, and I always say, if you can't um, get a mentor or get somebody who you can barter that information from, any money you have, hire a good consulting firm. Because then you could pay for the knowledge. A consulting firm would be like in the development industry. There's lots of development consultants. They get very rich off of all the developers and builders up here. And I would say, if you're going to invest, you know, invest in, in a good consulting firm to even start with a project that maybe be like a pilot project that you're looking at, right? So that's something you can do if your funds aren't quite there yet or your capital's not quite there yet. I've got a quick one to that. And I, uh, I'm going to disagree with my, my, my colleague here. I'm going to say if you're just starting out and you don't have mommy and daddy money, start small. You don't need to hire any consultants. Um, the money is in this room, okay? The power is in this room. Go to rooms like this where investors are hanging out and everyone wants to buy properties and do joint ventures. That's the way you start. Ideally, someone in that group has a little bit more experience than you and you partner with them and you, that's, how you, that's how you get your first one done. The first three are the toughest. Once you get past the first three, you start to get some momentum and then you flywheel, right? Um, but yeah, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna get started and you don't, you don't have deep pockets, Start with a small project, do 
duplex, triplex. You know, Bill 23 came out. There's ample opportunity now to buy a single, buy a semi, turn it into a fourplex, turn it into a triplex, right? Um, without development charges. So, you know, there's a new opportunity, a new landscape um, that's developing. And there's always going to be pockets within, um, you know, burgeoning cities that opportunities exist. So you have to kind of get that pulse. Um, I made a mistake of buying out in Alberta when I, you know, when I started, and I was away from the pulse, right? Um, my properties here did a lot better. I didn't really understand what was going on over there. So stay close to wherever it is you are and really like focus on and become like what we call like an expert in the area, right? It's like farm where you live um, is, is, is the approach um, when you want to get started. So on that note, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about um, through this conversation and through the last year as we've been doing this research is to help people understand that so many of these development companies, the megas, the big ones, started with one house. Right? And then hearing all of you speak tonight, one house, turning one house into two units or three units or four units is, is the best way and is the way that people get into this industry. Because one of the things Kofi and I didn't mention when we opened was that our goal with Future Builds is not just to get people into the industry, but to get people to stay in the industry. And so just to have that holding power, don't be afraid of starting small is a message I'm taking away from this and a message I'm taking away from the last year. So thank you for your questions. And I just want to go to Kofi before we thank our speakers and tell you a little bit more about what's to come. Yeah. And so just on the note, picking some of the threads you heard, you know, Lamont, you talked about the importance of mentorship and learning from folks who've been in the game. And Marcel, you just spoke about you know, Bill 23 and the fact that there's openings now with new legislation where it's easier than it's ever been to kind of buy a single detached home, turn that into three units, um, to take a semi, turn it into four. And so, I think it's a great time for kind of a shameless self-promotion for future builds, the program we're running, which is a program where folks will get this industry knowledge, everyone will be set up with a mentor, we will be specifically talking about the new legislation and how you could start a first project that's taking a single family home, turning it into a three uh, person unit. Maybe it's the home you're living in. Maybe you're building a unit for your parents. You're gonna have someone renting the basement and putting a kind of granny suite or a laneway suite in the back. That's what the curriculum will be built around and you'll be able to be in a community of kind of young, ambitious, hungry, intelligent, brilliant, racialized entrepreneurs from across the region. And applications are open now. They will be open until March 14th. 17th. 17th. <laughs> oh, my bad. <laughs> till March 17th. And so there will be information afterwards. Myself, Zara, really anyone with a name tag who you see will be here to give you more information around it. We've had a great um, support and momentum for the program. Shout out, we had a Globe and Mail article on the weekend, last weekend, sorry. And this week we've got Toronto Star coming up. So we've seen so many people in the industry, in the city, excited about what's happening. We hope this is the first of many cohorts, but we'd invite everyone here who's interested in real estate development, getting a step into the game, check out the Infrastructure Institute's website, look at future builds, and we'd welcome your application for that cohort. Oh, my man, I've got a question. Wow. Well, I'm working towards it. Um, and let's just say, when you get into the affordable world, it's not easy. Um, the hurdles of development are one side, and the hurdles of building affordable housing is just a different beast on its own. Um, but the fact that with building affordable housing, you can house the people that need it the most, and that you can bring integrity to people. I think it's sort of, for me, the most important part of that project. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm trying, so hopefully we'll get there with the help of everyone that's working on this project. Yep. And I just say with, yeah. with our program as well, our aspiration is not just to diversify the industry, but also to get affordable housing built. And part of our long game, just to reveal our cards, 
is going to the CMHCs of the world, who's a partner for this, going to the financial industry and saying, look at all of the BIPOC talent that's in this city that's ready to develop. Let's create special streams of capital so BIPOC folks can be creating affordable units in their builds to help serve our communities in ways that are culturally sensitive and make sense. So I think we share that aspiration and share we're supporting you and everyone here who's thinking not just about how do we build things, but how do we build affordable units to house families and support our communities. So on that note, um, Marcel said it better than we, than we could have, which is the community starts in this room, whether you're applying or not applying. I'm seeing folks from all sort of across the continuum of real estate development in this room and so many folks we don't know. So we want to get you into these conversations and out and eating all the wonderful food that we've ordered for tonight. So we'll just quickly say, um, first of all, thank you to our amazing panelists. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Sherry, Odine, Lamont, and Marcel. Also, just thank you for being beacons for us. We just finished this research, and our hearts were heavy. Because all we were talking to people, and even the most esteemed peers are saying, yeah, we're doing it, and it's hard. Um, so it's just, it, you, you all have been such beacons in our real estate development industry, and you continue to do such bold and amazing things. And we are here to sort of keep you in our community and keep these stories flowing. We want to thank the School of Cities for hosting us and the Infrastructure Institute for being such a tremendous partner as we bring this program to life. I want to say a special shout out to the Future Builds team, who are the folks who've been going up and down and running around with name tags. We've got Shelby, Maliha, Riza, Nav, Helen, and Maddie. They're all scattered around. They're all the ones wearing name tags. A round of applause for them. Also, if you have specific questions about the program, feel free to corner any one of them outside because they have all sorts of details about how to apply. And the last thing we'll just say is when you, if you are planning on, on coming to our program and get to the application, you're scratching your head, you're wondering if your project fits, send us an email. We're happy to talk through this. We want to workshop this with you. Even folks who don't get into the program will be part of our community. So please just reach out, have a conversation. Thank you for being here tonight. You've warmed our hearts by your interest in this topic, uh, and we'll look forward to chatting with you more outside. Thanks so much. Thank you.